All right, all right. Praise the Lord. Okay. Man, we have a friendly crew in here. <laughs> Welcome to everybody watching online. We're just greeting everybody, so greetings to everybody watching online on Facebook or, or on YouTube. <laughs> I've lost control already. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Well, somewhere in the midst of worship, everybody woke up. You get some coffee or something in you? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everybody to High Praise Central Minnesota. Thank you for braving the weather. Anybody uh, lose power at home this morning? And, and just was glad to see that there was power on at church? I was glad to see there was power on at church. <laughs> Well, welcome again. Um, if we have any first-time visitors here this morning, we'd like to especially welcome you. Um, if, uh, if you raise your hand, here, Jason here will get you a uh, welcome card. It's just, uh, you can fill that out so we can have a little information about you. Uh, we, we use that to sell it to, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but if you guys could fill that out. Uh, if you have any questions about the church, you can write that on the back. and You can either drop it in the offering um, basket when we take offering in a moment, or there's also a drop box in the lobby in the back there that you can drop those in. So we just thank you. We give our first-time visitors a warm, high praise Central Minnesota welcome. Thank you guys for coming. We're a small family here, so so new people stand out. Sorry about that. Just just the way it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, well, then you know Andrew. Never mind. Never mind. Then we'll give you a hard time. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hard time throughout the sermon then. Okay. Well, it is a wonderful time of our service this morning. You all know what time it is. It is offering, offering time, time for our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Uh, if you need an envelope for your giving, if you're giving by cash, would you raise your hand and Jason will get you an envelope. Uh, make sure you get your name on there so we can give you a record of your giving. If you're writing out a check, you do not need an envelope. Uh, you can write checks out to High Praise, uh, HPCM or Floodgates. Any of those will do. Uh, we also have a kiosk in the back if you want to give by uh, credit card or check card. And for uh, the folks online, if you want to give online, you can give online at www.highpraisecentralmn.com. All right. However you give, we always, uh, what, what do we always say? You give cheerfully and hilariously, that we give with the right heart, the right mindset, that there, there is so much power attached to giving. There is, throughout the scriptures, throughout the word, there is power attached to giving, but not just giving for the sake of giving. There's power attached to giving with the right heart, giving with the right mindset. Uh, Paul said it this way, we, you know, we, we know the scripture that my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. But what many people don't realize is right before that, he is, he is um, complimenting the church on giving, that they gave to him when they didn't need to give him, to him, when he didn't ask for their giving, and when they were the only ones that gave to him to supply for, for his, his trips that he, he was going on. And he said, because of your, your heart of gratitude, your heart of giving, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. That is an awesome, awesome thing. So when we give, however we give, we are supposed to give cheerfully and hilariously with the right heart and knowing that our God will show up on our behalf. Amen? You take your gifts in your hands this morning. Father God, I just thank you for each gift. I thank you for each giver. I thank you that as we give this morning, as we give with the cheerful hearts, Father God, that you will use these gifts for the advancement of your kingdom, uh, not just here in uh, High Praise Central Minnesota, uh, but beyond these walls and in Central Minnesota, in Minnesota and beyond, Father God. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for the seed that we are planting, and we expect a harvest because your word says that when we give, it will be given back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, that when we give, you will rebuke the devourer on our behalf. So we thank you for abundant increase in our lives as we give cheerfully and hilariously this morning. And everybody said, amen. 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 Thank you all for your, for your giving. Okay. Um, just a few quick announcements here. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a few weeks now, but I haven't actually announced it for you so that you guys know. Um, and, and 
if, for you people online, you are clearly watching online, but you may not know that uh, we have our sermons are recorded now and they are archived on YouTube. So you can watch any of the ones for the past, uh, I don't know, four weeks or so, however long we've been, been recording them. Uh, so those are archived on YouTube and there's links to that on our, on our webpage, highpraisecentralmn.com. So you can go back. Uh, usually we're just a, uh, we get the, the, you can watch it at Facebook live anytime. Go back and watch it if you're on Facebook, but you can, the YouTube ones usually get up within a day or two uh, after the Sunday morning services. So uh, make sure you check that out if you uh, are traveling or miss services or just want to go back and, and listen to, to me making fun of Eric a little bit or something like that. That's usually uh, kind of a standard thing on Sunday mornings, right, Eric? Pastor Eric. Always. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, also, here's what's coming up at uh, High Praise Central Minnesota. Um, we have, uh, let's see, our prophetic training is the next thing that is coming up. Prophetic, prophetic training Thursday, June 22nd at, at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. Thursday, June 22nd, 6.30 p.m. here at the church. We will be uh, just doing a training and activation on the prophetic uh, I highly encourage you to come to that, even if you've been to our other trainings and activations. We're going to do it slightly different this time. Don't know exactly what it'll look like, but it won't be exactly the same material. And it's always good. It's an opportunity to not just hear about the prophetic, but, but flow in the prophetic in a safe environment to learn and to grow in it. And so I strongly encourage you to come if you can come. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, coming up in July, Thursday, July uh, 13th, 6.30 p.m., we'll be doing our family intercession. This is where we get together here again at the church, and we just pray. We intercede for one another's needs at the church. Uh, as we always say, church is nothing if not family, and so we want to pray for our needs as a church family. So if you can make it to that, uh, if you need prayer or if you want to pray over somebody or just uh, you know connect and fellowship, uh, we encourage you to do that. Also, in July, July 21st, Friday, July 21st, 7 p.m., we will be having a family bonfire at Municipal Park in Sauk Rapids. We've rented the pavilion, so if you, it's after dinner time, but we encourage you, if you want to bring something for everybody to snack on, uh, that sort of, sort of stuff, you can bring that. So we will have power for that, um, but also, you know, s'more stuff, chairs, any of the, that sort of thing, you know, make sure that you bring that. But I, I strongly encourage you to come. Just this past week on Friday, we did our, um, our Rocks baseball game, and for those of you who came, it was a blast. I, I don't know about you, but I had a great time. I know Sarah said she had a great time, and I think she watched about one inning of baseball. Uh, she was just fellowshipping and connecting and having fun. Kids had a blast. Uh, it, was, it was just a lot of fun. Eric just really enjoyed me getting up and leaving and getting the kids' food 50 different times, you know, walking past him. But uh, we all had a good time. It was just a great time. So I encourage you to come to the bonfire. It was a great time to connect and really make deeper relationships. Amen? Um, all right, let's see here. And, uh, oh, the, the, I didn't talk to you, Lisa, ahead of time. Do you have the sign-up? No, I Okay. Okay, so uh, we have uh, High Praise VBS coming up August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Uh, it is, is 5 p.m. to about 7.30 p.m., that, that sort of time frame. For ages 11, uh, 4 to 11, if you have kids that are in that 12, 13-year-old range and they want to help, Helping would be great. Uh, we are going to have a sign-up for helpers next week uh, in the lobby there. If, if, so if you're able, able of help, to help, to supervise in any way, shape, or form, even for one day, uh, we'll have that sign-up in the back, and we would love to have uh, more help. Just, you know, keep an eye on the kids and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, and invite friends. And, yeah, if you have kids, if your kids have friends in that age group, uh, nieces, nephews, whatever the case is, uh, be sure to invite them as well. So it'll be a good time. And also in August, I'm very excited, we announced this last week, Apostle Robert Gay will be back. He will be here uh, actually in... Yeah, yeah. woo! <laughs> Robert Gay is the pastor of High Praise Panama City, our parent church. He is our uh, apostolic covering, and we're just so excited to have him back. He was here last year, but it, the building wasn't quite done yet, so he saw it in, in progress of of being finished, but uh, this will be his first time coming here in this building to minister, so we're super excited about that. Um, also, so make sure, um, and, and notice that we have a Saturday service as well, so make sure you make note of that. Invite your friends um, and, and, and put it on your calendar. And also in August, later in August, prophet and revivalist Ryan Johnson will be back, Woo! as we call him 2.0. Um, we, we love Ryan. He was uh, really our first outside of the state minister that we brought in back when we were floodgates. Uh, and he will be here on Thursday, August 24th, and Friday, August 25th. 
uh, at 7 p.m. He is actually just traveling through the Twin Cities uh, on his way back home, and so that's why it's kind of it's not on a Sunday. He's going to be stopping in here uh, on on that Wednesday. We don't know what time yet, and so he'll be ministering Thursday and Friday. Um, so you don't do not want to miss that. Ryan is awesome. Uh, Let's see. Also, really quick, uh, again, next week out in the lobby, I'm going to um, put out a, a public directory um, for you guys to sign up for. Um, w- the idea here is I want to give everybody an opportunity if, if you uh, want to connect with uh, people in the church, have n- numbers and email addresses. But I don't want, you know, we have you fill that out on the cards, but I don't want to assume that for anybody. So we're going to you know, let you fill out the information if you want your number out there, your email address out there. For, it's for just for people within the church. But I'll have a sign up out there. Uh, so even if you've given us your number before, I'm in, I'll encourage you now to go and sign up out there. And then we'll print out some copies. And if you want a church directory, that's, that's where that will, will be. So, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I don't want to assume you know, anybody's, you know, I don't want to take for granted anybody's privacy. Let's put it that way. And also tonight... Floodgates, uh, we will be doing uh, an evangelism training at Floodgates. Uh, I'm really excited about this. We kind of came up with this really cool plan, and you guys know that we don't often plan uh, uh, Sunday night, so plan for Sunday night. Woo! Uh, That's awesome. But we're going to be doing evangelism training with a specific idea in mind of Summertime by George starting next Wednesday. So we're going to lay out, we're going to do some some overall evangelism training, but also lay out a specific plan that we want to do for uh, outreach during Summertime by George, because we have literally thousands, tens of thousands of people out here at our back door. It's a great ministry opportunity, so how are we going to do this and, and, and really show them something different, show them what high praise is all about. So we'll be talking about that tonight, doing an activation tonight as well. So we encourage you to come to that. All right. I think that is all the announcements. Anything I forgot? Sarah, Eric, Desiree, we're all good? All right. Well, you guys ready to get into the Word this morning? Yes. All right. All right. What? What the? I tell you. Did it again. See if my scriptures come up correctly. Nope. Thank you, Andrew. Technology has been fun the past couple weeks. All right, but we are still we still have audio online. Last week it was the audio, so we're good there. Everyone can hear us online. That's awesome. Andrew's gonna help me with the scriptures. We can do the the fivefold acts on there. All right, sweet. Okay. So this morning we are continuing our series called, that I'm calling Fivefold Acts. And what we are doing is we are looking at the fivefold ministry, the ministry of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And we're looking at that through the prism of the book of Acts, the early church. Last week we kind of did an overarching uh, sort, sort of look at this and laid the groundwork for the series. We looked at... Um, the uh, primary function of the fivefold ministry that applies to all of the fivefold ministry, which is to equip and to edify the saints so that we can, as saints, utilize the grace that God has given us, so we can recognize the power in the grace that God has given us uh, to, the ex- to the extent that we can now step into God's plan for our lives and become properly functioning members of the body of Christ. Amen. Does that make sense? That, that the fivefold ministry is, is to help us discover our gifts and then begin to walk in our gifts so that we become the, the piece of the body of Christ that we were designed to be. The fivefold ministry as a whole is designed to flow in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. In the early church, in the book of Acts, for the first um, 20 years, there wasn't a single book that we would call of the New Testament written. And realistically, in the first 30 years, because the book of Acts covers the first 30 years of the church's history, there was, there was, they didn't have access to a single thing that we would call the New Testament. Few things were written, but they weren't readily available. Um, and a lot of things were written at the, end, at the same time, including the book of Ephesians was written at the same time as the book of Acts at the end of that 30 years. Therefore, that means in that first 30 years of the church's existence, they had to utterly and completely rely on the Holy Spirit. They had to rely on what Jesus had taught them and the Holy Spirit, and they had to rely on the Holy Spirit to remind them of what Jesus had taught them, okay? There was was no alternative. I mean, they could go to synagogue, they had Old Testament, but even that they didn't have uh, easy access to. So they were absolutely reliant on the Holy Spirit, and that means the fivefold ministry was absolutely reliant on the Holy Spirit, 
The fivefold ministry is throughout the book of Acts. However, it wasn't outlined. It wasn't uh, enumerated until Ephesians, was, which was written at the end of the book of, the, of Acts, which means the most important thing when it comes to identity, when, when it comes to fivefold ministry, is not the title. It's what we call the flow and the function. The flow and the function. It's not about, this is my title, and you need to respect my title, and, uh, and, and call me this and, and do this. It's about, this is how I am wired. This is how I am designed to move. This is how I am designed to operate. And people recognize and just say, you know, like I used the example with Pastor Eric, that really he's wired as an evangelist. You just, you talk to him, you hear his heart, you hear his, you, you see him in action, and he is, he's just got a heart for evangelism. You don't have to to uh, ask him about it. You can see it in him. You can hear it in his voice and the way he talks. We actually call him a prophetic evangelist because he's also uh, got, got a strong uh, hold of the, of the prophetic office as well. It is possible to have what we call slash um, ministry titles where you are multiple ministry titles, uh, prophetic evangelists or in, and things like that. But the point is, is that the uh, identity comes from flow and function, not from the title. Okay? And uh, it also comes from a dedication to the call because there are many people that are called but don't show the dedication to the call to, in order to reach the fullness of what God has called them to be. Paul actually says it this way, that many are called but few are chosen. We could, we could say it this way, many are called but few are commissioned. You need to show a dedication, a commitment to the call in order to really um, come into the office of, of a fivefold minister. Amen? All right, so this is the, 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 uh, the groundwork for the fivefold ministry, the kind of the baseline for the fivefold ministry in the book of Acts. Today, we are going to get into more specific, in the, in the specific offices, and we're going to be looking at the office of apostle. I've encouraged you um, in, uh, in previous weeks to, to invite people. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about the office of the prophet. And invite people, and, and, and hopefully people are watching online as well, because I know in central Minnesota here, there is a lot of uh, interest in this topic, because we don't hear about apostles and prophets. And so as a church that clearly, obviously, we're talking about it, uh, Apostle Robert is coming, we believe in the office of the apostle and the prophet. And you may say, hey, you know, Apostle Robert from Panama City is coming, you should come to church, and that's going to catch people's interest around here. Who, the apostle? What? And it's going to start a conversation. We, when we tell people we're an apostolic church, uh, it inevitably, they light up and begin asking a lot of questions. People are interested this, in, this, in this area, but they haven't heard a lot about it. So that's kind of the heart behind this entire series, but especially in the prophet and the apostle. So today we're looking at the apostle, and I want to start by doing what the fivefold ministry does and equipping you a little bit. See, there is a, a lot of opinions, a lot of doctrine, a lot of theology out there about the fivefold ministry, especially the office of the apostle. There are some people out there, uh, Christian people, there are some denominations out there do, that do not believe that the office of the apostle and prophet are for today. Now, I want to be clear. I said this last week. I will say it again. The, the people that believe this, we will see them in heaven. This is not a question of salvation. This is not, uh, you know, that uh, you're not going, you're going to hell if you don't believe this. That's not what this is about. I, we just believe that you're not receiving the fullness that you could be receiving if you're not receiving uh, an apostle and a prophet ministry for today. But what I want to do is I want to just quickly outline the main arguments that people use when they say that the office of the apostle isn't for today because you may very well come across this, and I want you to know uh, for what we believe, but also what else is out there, not so that you can argue. This isn't about arguing with people, because people that don't believe it, it's for today, you're going to have a very hard time. You're not going to be able to argue them into believing something different. The Holy Spirit can convict them into it, um, so I'm not giving you ammunition for arguments. I am just equipping you so you can be confident in what you believe, and maybe plant a few seeds here and there as the Lord leads you. So the primary arguments come from Acts chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, we'll read the scriptures here in a section, second, but the ar arguments go like this, that these two scriptures are outlining the requirements to be an apostle, okay? These are the requ requirements for being an apostle, and therefore, um, be, and, and we'll get into this, uh, because these are the requirements and it's not possible to meet these requirements today, it's not possible to have apostles today. That's the, the crux of the argument. 
So in Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, what we have here is we have the, the 11 disciples, now apostles, um, that are left. Judas has, has killed himself, and they are meeting together right before the day of Pentecost, and they're trying to decide who's going to replace Judas, okay? They, they, they've looked at the scriptures. The scriptures say that there was 12 and one betrayed, and, and then he was replaced. So they're saying the scriptures say we have to replace Judas, so what are we going to do? All right, this is the backdrop of it, and it says in verse 21, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time that Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay? This is the scripture that is used. Now, there's two primary requirements that the, that the people that interpreted this use. They say that you have to have witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you actually read the, the wording of this, you will, you, you will probably see the problem with that. The wording of this, this is not a poor translation. This is an accurate translation. I went and I looked in the Greek. What they say is that you need to become a witness with us of his resurrection. Nowhere in there does it say that you had to be a witness of the resurrection. And if we actually take it a step further, that word witness is the same word that we use when we're talking about going out and evangelizing. We, get, we witness to people. We, witnesses give their testimony. All right. So what they're really saying here is not that you have to witness the resurrection with your own eyes. What they're saying is that you need to be willing to become, it says become. How do you, you either are a witness or you aren't a witness, first of all. But what they're saying here is that you need to be willing to go out and give testimony to Jesus' resurrection. Well, duh. I mean, you're going to pick somebody that's not willing? Hey, 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 Sarah, would you be an apostle? Yeah, but I'm not willing to go out and talk about it. Then what's the point of picking her, right? We need somebody that's willing to go out and be a witness to the testimony of Jesus. The other half of this is that they must have... Um, accompanied us the entire time from when Jesus was, uh, from the baptism of John into, until the time that Jesus was taken up into heaven. Now, that, you know, that's a good, you would think about the situation that they're in, all right? They have to pick somebody. It's just kind of a logical thing, right? Nowhere in this entire scripture does it say that we are required to pick somebody who has been with us the entire time, but who else are you going to pick, there's not a huge group of people yet. The, the day of Pentecost hasn't happened. The 3,000 people weren't saved. And even if they, they were, if you pick somebody who's newly saved, then you got to teach them everything. Why wouldn't we pick somebody that was with us the entire time so we don't have to start from scratch with them, Amen. right? This is, I mean, it's just logical. They're picking from the logical group of people. They are not saying that this is a requirement. It's, it, this is what they have to choose from, Okay. And again, nowhere in there does it say anything remotely like the word requirement. Now, the second one is in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 and 2. This is the apostle Paul. And Paul is writing to the Corinthians in response to other people calling him a false apostle. And he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Okay, what they really key on there is that have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? They're saying, well, because Paul clearly creates a problem for the previous um, scripture. So they say, well, Paul saw the resurrected Jesus uh, on the road to Damascus, and therefore Paul can be an apostle. But we, really, if you look at this, Paul is, is not, again, listing requirements to be an apostle. Nowhere do we see that word. What Paul is listing here is his personal qualifications for being an apostle. Amen. His personal qualifications, not the requirements. If you have ever applied for a job, you know what I'm talking about. My uh, career, b before we started all of this, uh, my my job has, is, is as a computer programmer. That's what I went to school for. That's, that's what I've done for years and years as a software engineer, computer programmer. When I apply for new jobs as a computer programmer, uh, there are requirements that are listed. And usually for me, it's things like programming languages. You need to know this language, C Sharp, Visual Basic. I know I'm speaking Greek to a lot of you, but that's okay. This New Testament was written in Greek. Um, <laughs> 
But uh, it, it lists these programming languages and maybe um, database things like SQL Server and Oracle and all these things that are requirements because the employer's systems run on those things, and so they have to have an employee that knows those things, okay? Those are the requirements. But now, on the other side of that, I am going to, when I fill out my resume, list my qualifications. I'm going to say, I worked at this company for five years, and I did this, this, and this. I worked at this company for six years, and I did this, this, and this. Now, hopefully, my qualifications make me more qualified than somebody else who's applying that has the same requirements. Yeah. You understand? There's a difference. Nobody will meet the same qualifications as me. Yeah. Nobody will have the exact same job history as me and exact same skill set as me. Mm -hmm. Those are my qualifications. That is a different thing. And that is what Paul is listing here. He is saying, these are my qualifications. You know me. You know I've seen the resurrected Jesus. You've known what I've done in your life, what I poured into your life. Why are you believing these people that you don't know that are calling me a false apostle? They're trying to fool you. And actually, if you really look at these two scriptures, if you were to take them um, in, in the context of, of them being requirements for being an apostle, the two contradict one another. The two contradict one another because Paul wasn't with them from the beginning of the baptism of John. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't actually witness the resurrection of Jesus. He witnessed the resurrected Jesus. So now we're splitting hairs and definitions, and, but take it the other way. Paul says one of his you know, qualifications is that are you not my work in the Lord? He's talking to the Corinthian church. He's saying, I'm qualified to be an apostle because I built up the, the Corinthian church. That means the other 11, the other 12 apostles, they didn't build the Corinthian church. They must not be apostles. There's a contradiction there that can't be, that, that, that can't be worked out. And the Bible does not contradict itself. If we find a contradiction, the, the problem isn't with the Bible, it's with our interpretation of it. And as we've said in previous weeks, we do not make doctrine out of a single scripture or, or even <laughs> multiple scriptures that seem to contradict themselves. I'll take you one step further and give you, give you a, a little um, uh, example now of, of why we believe, well, why, why we, well, I'll say why we believe that uh, the office of the apostle, biblically speaking, is still for today. Uh, and the example is, the, uh, is Apollos and Timothy. Apollos and Timothy are listed as apostles in the New Testament by Paul, okay? Apollos uh, in 1 Corinthians and Timothy in 1 Thessalonians, and usually the way you read these things is like this, that, that Paul says, I'm here with Timothy and Apollos and, and, and us apostles do this. Us apostles say this. So he includes himself and them when he says, we apostles do this or that, okay? That's kind of the context that it's written in. Now, he clearly calls them apostles um, more than once, actually. And we, there's a problem here is that, um, that, Tim, that Apollos and Timothy don't fit in to the, either one of those requirements. Apollos, when we first see him in the book of Acts, he's preaching, and, and he's zealous, and he's excited, and, and he's, he's, he's doing it, but he's preaching the baptism of John. He's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of God is, is, is at hand. And what, what we see is that there's a couple believers that pull him aside and say, basically, we love what you're doing, Apollos, but uh, haven't you heard about Jesus being resurrected? Don't you know about this? Why don't you, you include this? And, and they, they minister to him, and he's like, yeah, all right, this is awesome. And he goes out, and he begins to preach the resurrected Jesus. But remember, one of the qualifications was you had to be a witness yeah. of the resurrected Jesus. So how in the world could Apollos be an, Apollo when he, uh, be an apostle when he didn't even know that that Jesus was resurrected. I don't know how you don't know that. I mean, I know that they didn't have the internet back then, but you know, it, you have to be living under a rock. Maybe he had heard rumors, but he didn't really understand the power of it. Point is, is that he is numbered among apostles and he did not see the resurrected Jesus. And Timothy is an even better argument. Yeah. We first see Timothy in Acts chapter 16. He begins to, to, to walk with Paul. Acts chapter 16 is written 20 years into the history of the church. Okay, So it's 20 years in, into this time frame that Timothy starts following Paul. Again, Paul later in 1 Thessalonians calls Timothy an apostle. The problem is that it clearly says that Timothy at this point is a teenager. A little bit of math lets us know that Timothy wasn't even born when Jesus was resurrected, and yet he is called an apostle. 
These are the sort of things that bring credence to the idea that, the, that and many more, that the apostle is still uh, alive and active today and can be. In fact, there's as many as 25 people that are called apostles in the New Testament. That includes Jesus. If you take him out, that's 24. Um, and uh, that, that's a lot more than the 12 or 13 that people believe that there were. All right. Now, um, real quickly as well, just a couple other things real quickly till we, before we dive in. There are some people out there that believe that in the flow and function of the apostle and prophet, but they don't believe in actually you know, giving out the title of apostle and prophet. And this usually comes, and there's denominations that have, have this belief as well. This usually comes from abuses, that they've seen people that have, have taken the title for their own personal gain and used it to control people and that sort of thing. We've said this many times before here. We will say it again. Just because some people abuse the truth does not mean we refuse the truth, yeah. right? But their attitude is this. If there's these abuses, why bother with the titles? We believe in the flow and the function. And in a way, they're correct. The flow and function is the most important thing, absolutely, without a doubt. But the title is still important. God would not have inspired the Apostle Paul to write Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, if it was not important to God. He could have, this is God inspired scripture. God wrote the Bible. He would not have put it in there if he did not want it in there, if they weren't important in some way, shape, or form. It is important to God. The flow and the function is the primary thing, but the title is also important. And all you need to know to understand this is, um, is how houses are built. How houses are built. If you've ever built a house or done a remodel or know somebody who has, you know that you need a whole bunch of different construction workers to come in and build a house, right? You with me? Yeah. We'll call our construction workers ministers. Yeah. You need people to come in and do the work. However, you don't hire a roofer to install your trim. Yeah. You don't hire a, a plumber to frame your house, mm-hmm. right? You with me? Yeah. Now, the truth of the matter is, is a roofer could come in and probably install your trim and do a passable job, do a good job. But the, the trick is, is if you hire somebody that, that is an expert in trim and cabinets and that sort of thing. And I don't know if you, if you guys know this, but, but trim work, it seems simple, but it's a really complicated, time-consuming thing if you've ever tried to do it. Making the cuts, Eric knows, because he, he spent like, what, what, you spent like two hours on this cut right here? That's, that's not even kidding, and a few cuts and bruises, and it took a couple days for all of this, trying to get these angles and everything right. Somebody um, who, but somebody who, that's their profession, that's their specialty, could come in and do it like that. And, and you know, sorry, Eric, but do a better job. You did a great job, but, you know, when you hire a professional, what, what happens is, is they come in and they can do a quicker job, they can do a better job, a more efficient job, and, and really, you know, it, it saves you time and money because you know that they're going... Now, I, I understand that, you know, maybe some people don't do as good a job as we expect, but the, uh, the expectation is you hire somebody to do your trim, they're going to do a better job than some lay person coming in and doing your trim, Amen. all right? Um, and and you, uh, we've, we hi- had somebody... And put it this way, I, I have helped install a roof before, and I, the next day, had muscles that hurt that I didn't know existed. And we installed that roof on a very simple, um, simple roof, uh, did it for my brother's house, and we did it. It was great. We had a team of people. It was a lot of work. Um, but then when we had hail damage on our roof, we hired some people to come in and do our roof, which was much more complex, and they did it way faster, way better than we did on my brother's simple little roof, okay? So it, it, even with, with something like that, there's just an efficiency that comes from doing what you are trained to do, right? Amen. Five-fold ministry is exactly the same way. When you know what the flow and function of an apostle is, what the flow and function of a, of a, a prophet is, you can receive of that thing. You know what to expect, and you can receive of that thing more fully than if you have a prophet standing up preaching and you're expecting to be pastored, yeah. okay? You're going to receive so much more if you know what to expect. So this is an equipping for you. Not everybody's called to five-fold ministry, clearly, but we'll have five-fold ministries up here on this platform. And when you know and understand the flow and function, you'll be able to receive better. The Bible says it this way, receive a prophet as a prophet and get a prophet's reward. Amen. We can substitute any of the five-fold ministries in there. We want to get the, the reward in its fullness of 
of what, uh, what that person has come to bring, what their anointing is. And you know, we could also say it this way, receive a prophet as a pastor and your reward is frustration. Yeah. Right? We don't want to be frustrated. We want to know and understand. Also, again, um, just because not everybody is called to fivefold ministry does not mean that uh, we, we can't flow in the same anointings. We've said it this way. You don't have to be a prophet to be prophetic. You don't have to be an apostle to be apostolic. To a degree, every single believer is supposed to flow in the anointings of the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministers are just the specialists that come in and help train you in that specialty. Okay? All right. Now, um, so the title is still important. Um, also, uh, just a quick note, we'll talk more about this in coming weeks. The fivefold ministry is not a hierarchy. It is not a ladder to climb. It is not, I start at the bottom at teacher and work my way up to apostle. It is an anointing. It, it is a recognition of how God made you, how you're wired. And uh, it, you, don't, you just don't jump around. And, and, uh, and just, just because you want a bigger title, you're cl- climbing the corporate ladder. That's not how it works. And, it, and it's not saying that one... Fivefold ministry is more important than the other. It is not it at all. They are all equally as important. Amen? Amen. They are all equally as important. Um, the, the listing that Paul gives is not a matter of importance. It's a matter of order. It's the proper order that, these, that the ministry needs to flow in. And we know that glory follows order. Okay? And then, and then finally, before we dive into the specifics here, um, the, there is a, I want to make it clear that there is a difference between Um, false, immature, and hurt. You take any well-known minister out there uh, that that is on TV or wrote a book or whatever, and you Google them and you put false by their name. Kenneth Copeland, false. Uh, Joyce Meyer, false. Bishop Bill Hammond, false. And you will get a whole slew of websites dedicated to pointing out how they are false teachers. They are false prophets. They are false apostles, whatever. You know, we'll just, we'll go with false prophet, because that's the most common one, but no, when I say false prophet, I'm talking about all, any of them, but they, they, they'll list out false, you know, blah, 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 blah. Now, hear me when I tell you this. Most of the time, when people are out there just accusing, pointing fingers, and calling other people, other ministers, false this and false that, they are closer to being the false teacher, the false apostle, than the one they're pointing at, okay? I'm not saying that they are, I'm saying they are closer to being the false prophet than the one that they're pointing at. The, the reason being is that being a false teacher, a false prophet, first of all, does not mean that you never make a mistake. You know, you know like heaven forbid, you know, people are watching you and listening to you and you slip up and you, you don't say anything, something quite right, or you don't, you don't ex- explain it right, or you just you know, mix up your words. I've never done that, but I know Pastor Eric has, so he can relate. But, you know, heaven forbid that happens, and now, boom, false. In, in, end of the story, you, you've made a mistake, and, and you're labeled for the rest of your life. That makes no sense. No, a false prophet or teacher, any of those, is, is not somebody who makes a mistake. Uh, it's not somebody whose doctrine is different than yours, necessarily, either. Yeah. It is somebody who is specifically trying to deceive in order to cause division. Yeah. And specifically, consciously trying to cause division, constantly, or, uh, consciously trying to um, exert power, authority, influence, um, rob people of their money, whatever. They, they're purposely uh, twisting the scriptures for their benefit, and they know it. Yeah. Right? That is what a false teacher, a false apostle, a false prophet, any of those would be. Now, there are also out there, though, uh, immature prophets, immature teachers, pastors, and immature ministers. Uh, we see this in the book of Jonah. Jonah, the prophet Jonah, was an immature prophet. Yeah. Okay, And uh, it, it is very possible to be immature. One of the things that I've learned about the fivefold ministry, especially the office of the apostle and the prophet, is that a sign, not necessarily, you know, don't, don't write this in stone, but a good sign that somebody is an immature prophet is, is, is somebody that is obsessed with their title, you know, introduce themselves as a prophet. They want you to call them prophet. They tell you about all their prophecies that came true. Me, 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 me. They may truly be called into the office of a prophet, yeah. but that to me just shows immaturity. That's why we need to, fivefold ministers need to attach themselves to a mature minister of the same stream as them. Yeah. Uh, a prophet needs to attach themselves to a mature prophet or, or apostle. Uh, an evangelist needs to attach himself to a mature evangelist so they can, they can 
and learn what the maturity in their office looks like. Yes. And there is also hurt ministers. Uh, ministry can be a very difficult thing. It can be a hurtful th thing. Other ministers, uh, people that you, you've shepherded and min ministered to, and, 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 you know, Paul had this. He had people that he called sons, that he, Barnabas was one of them, that he, he brought with him and he poured himself into. And then at some point in their relationship, he turns and he betrays him. Okay? It can cause hurts. And if you don't deal with those hurts, if you don't have an understanding revelation of healing and deliverance, yeah. those hurts can come out in your ministry. Yeah. And you can begin to minister from a hurt heart. Now, both immaturity and hurt ministers can cause damage to the body of Christ. They can cause damage and hurt to people. That's why healing and deliverance is so important. That's why having uh, somebody, a covering is so important. Um, but that doesn't make them false, amen? And we have actually personally seen people that have been operating from places of hurt or immaturity in the body of Christ as a, as a prophet and, and other things that have turned around, God has revealed it to them, they have repented, and it's just, it, God can do awesome things through those people. Uh, it, so anyways, enough on that. All right, so let's, uh, that all makes sense? Yeah. You good? We laid the groundwork there. So now that's just the beginning. Okay, interlude. Now we got another two hours of <laughs> the office of an apostle. Now, um, what, uh, what I want to get into today is I'm going to give you three primary anointings of the apostle, the office of apostle. Again, remembering that these anointings also apply to you as being an apostolic people, yeah. okay? But there are three primary anointings of an apostle. I, these are not the only anointings. Uh, this is just what God gave to me uh, to release to you, okay? So the three are this, sending, building, and fathering. If you want to write those down, you can write those down. Sending, building, and fathering. So first of all, sending. The word apostle is a Greek word, and it literally means sent one. Uh, it can also be like an ambassador or a messenger that is sent out, okay? Um, and many times in the Greek the Greek apostle title was a military title. Uh, it was a military term often used. And now I want you to, to listen closely to this. You, you're a prophetic people. You can you see the revelation in this right here. But the Greek apostle was a military officer or person, and he was sent out in order to establish the Greek way of life in newly conquered areas to establish the Greek way of life in language, in culture, in customs, in literature, in government. You with me? So an apostle or an apostolic people are sent to a place. How many know and understand that we are in this world, but we are not of this world? That we, we are citizens of the United States, but we have a greater citizenship, and that's in heaven. Right? We are first and foremost citizens of heaven, that, that we have a calling, we have a mission to go establish the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God here on earth. Amen. Right, So we are taking ground, we are taking ter territory, and when we go, when we are sent out to a new area and conquer that area for the kingdom of God, I'm not talking about, about actual military, I'm talking about spiritual warfare yeah. going on here. We have done spiritual warfare in this place for yeah. central Minnesota, made yeah. declarations and decrees, big declarations and decrees over central Minnesota, not just this ministry, but over this entire area, over every church, every ministry that proclaims the name of Jesus, yeah. we, we make declarations and decrees over them, amen? Amen. And when we do that, when we're, we are sent out, and when we, we're sent out in an apostolic people, you're sent out to your, to your workplace, yeah. to your school. Yeah. The language should change, yeah. right? The things that are coming out of people's mouths should begin to change. The culture, the atmosphere of that place should begin to change. Customs, the things that you did before, you're not going to do any more. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. The customs should change. The literature should change. Amen? And we, all those things change, I guarantee you the government will begin to change as well. Amen. All right? We are called to be sent out and to begin to implement change in the world that we live in, to begin to establish the kingdom of God, or we could say it this way, wherever we're sent, we are called to turn the world upside down. Amen. Now that's the, the Greek word for apostle that Jesus used the Greek word for apostle, but he also uh, was, when he was commissioning the disciples as the apostles, he also uh, kind of implemented the idea behind the Hebrew word for apostle as well. The Hebrew word for a sent one or a messenger, which is uh, shaliak. 
Shaliak is the Hebrew word, and that means, in addition to being sent out, is a Shaliak is one who is commissioned and authorized to fully represent his, the sender. Amen. One that is commissioned and authorized to fully represent his sender. How many of you know that all authority on heaven, on earth, and below the earth has been given to Jesus? Yeah. And now we have delegated authority through his name. Amen. That we are ambassadors of Christ here on earth. That we have been given we are authorized to go out and use his name wherever we need to use his name to establish the kingdom of God. That is an apostolic anointing, an apostolic call. Amen. That's right. Now, biblical apostles, just like the, uh, the, the Greek military ones, are likewise sent by God or sent by one another, and they're given specific missions to establish the kingdom of God. We see this throughout the book of Acts. I mean, this is basically the entire book of Acts. You see Paul, you know, at one place and he has a dream or he has a vision or the Holy Spirit just puts it on his heart and, and he goes to this place or that place. Or, or Peter sends Paul, says, okay, you're, we're sending you out to the Gentiles now. It, it's, it's constantly being sent here, sent there, sent there, sent there. And wherever they go, they are, they are establishing the kingdom of God. All right. It's, this is at the core of apostolic function being sent to an area and establishing the kingdom, whether that is, and it doesn't have to be geographical area. It can be ge geographical area, but it can also be people groups. There's, there's some people that are sent to just affect a certain people group, whether that be like Native Americans or, or uh, Somalis or something like that. There's people that have an apostolic call, not so much for an area or, or a, a geographical territory, but a people group, yeah. all right? Uh, it is just being sent, and to a degree... Every single one of us is sent. We have a sphere of influence. That's, that's really what an apostle is, is they have a sphere of apostolic influence. And every single one of us has a sphere of influence that's different than everybody else. We have a sphere of influence in our family, in our workplace, with our friends and our family. We have this, that sphere of influence, that sphere of authority where we are sent and we can utilize um, the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. That's the sending anointing. The second anointing is the building anointing. The building anointing. And we see this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians. <laughs> I know. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, according to the grace of God, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. So Paul equates himself, the Apostle Paul, to a wise master builder. So let me ask you this. If there's a building anointing on the office of apostle, then the question is, is to build what? Now, for a long time, the kind of the consensus is, and in a lot of places it still is, is that apostolic flow and function is church planters. That's what apostles do. They go and they plant churches. Now, that's true. You can do that as an apostle. That, that can be an apostolic flow and function without a doubt. But it is absolutely not limited to just churches. There is far, far, far more than, um, than just church planting to be apostolic. And by the way, there's a lot of people in this day and age that are out there planting churches that are not doing it apostolically. They're doing it in the ways of man in the ways of tradition and culture. It's, they're doing it under the banner of denomination or, or whatever the case is, but it's a man's formula. You take classes. This is how you plant a church. This is what you do. This is where you go. This is how you raise money. Ba, ba, ba. It's all lined up. This is the formula you do for, for, for planting a church. And you know what? God can use those churches. I'm not I'm not saying there's something wrong with those churches. What I'm saying, that is not an apostolic mindset. That is not an apostolic sending. Apostolic says, God, see, the building anointing starts with a strategic anointing, really, is what it is. That, that's, it's, it's, it's being strategic. It's saying, God, I will, I'll get ahead of myself just a little bit. The office of apostle, I mean, or a prophet, uh, I think we can all understand this, is primarily focused on what is God saying, right? What is God saying? In order to be a prophet, you've got to hear what God is saying, right? Yeah. The office of apostle is focused uh, also on what God is saying, but it's more focused not on, on, on what, what, to, what to release, but how do I do it, yeah. right? It's, it's focused on strategy. The, the prophet wants to release what God is saying. The apostle wants to get the strategy of heaven to see what is being said implemented on earth. Amen. 
right? They're like, okay, that's great, prophet. That's why they work very closely together. The prophet says this, 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 and this. And the apostle says, okay, now how do we make that happen? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the mindset behind it. So there's the strategy behind it, all right? Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, okay. I was like, where was I going with this? Um, there, there should be a strategy any time that you plant a church. It shouldn't just be, you know, well, this is how you do it. And I'm not just talking about where a lot of people will seek the Lord and where they're supposed to plant a church. But I mean every detail of it. What is your strategy for this region? How am I supposed to outreach? How am I supposed to look? How am I supposed to sound? What, God, how do I reach these people? Every ounce of it should be an apostolic strategic thing that you are seeking that from God. Amen. But there are other things that apostles build. Uh, one of the things that they build is fresh, fresh revelation. Now, when I say fresh revelation, I am not talking about adding or subtracting from the logos, from, from the word of God, okay? We're, that's not scriptural. We, we don't do that. We don't abide by that. Everything that we say and do should line up with the word of God as it is. But an apostle will oftentimes come in and bring new revelation to what's already written in the Bible, They'll bring a fresh revelation, a fresh understanding to it, a fresh movement. We have seen this a lot in the past 100, 200 years uh, in the kingdom of God. There's all kinds of movements that have happened. I'll give you a couple examples. Have you heard of the Word of Faith movement? Kenneth Hagin Sr.? All right. Kenneth Hagin Sr., although he wasn't called an apostle, was really working apostolically. He was doing an apostolic function restoring and building the, the word of faith movement. Now, again, a lot of people abuse that, but because some people abuse the truth doesn't mean we refuse the truth. Yeah. But that, that, that movement of the word of faith is something that Kenneth Hagin Sr. stewarded. That's an apostolic function. And you can do that with, with any of them. Um, the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal, the holiness, all of those have a few generals in them. That, yeah. that were the primary guys behind it. Those are the apostles of those movements. Yeah. The prophetic movement, the restoration of the office of the apostle. Our spiritual grandfather here, Bishop Bill Hammond, was one of the, if not the primary people that was responsible. He was the apostolic leader of the restoration of the office of the prophet and then later of the office of the apostle. Okay? That is a fresh revelation that's being released to the body of Christ. They are building something, but it's not a church. Okay. Now, apostles can also build things like organizations. We are connected with Apostle Ryan Lestrange. He has an organization. His organization isn't so much geographical or building churches. It's about really spreading revival. Yeah. And it's about connecting people that have a revival mindset, an apostolic mindset as well, um, these these sort of things, connecting people and equipping people to go out and do that type of ministry, not necessarily uh, start a church or something like that. It's more of an organization, uh, uh, connecting people, and he's the overseer of that. There's also apostolic movements. We have the Appeal to Heaven flag back there. For those of you who know Dutch Sheets and the Appeal to Heaven, that's really more of of a movement that Dutch Sheets, who is an apostle, is leading. It's, it's a movement to change in the way that we think and operate as the government, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, and also change the way we, we think and move in, in the government of the United States. That, that uh, we, well, I, I can't preach this whole message, but basically it's, it's a movement designed to change the culture of the United States and the culture of the church. And Apostle Dutch Sheets is leading that. We also see apostles leading schools or combinations of these different things. There's, there's, uh, the, idea, the point is, is it's not just limited to one small box. All right, with me? Now, apostles don't have to just affect the church or the kingdom of God. They can, well, they, they, everything should be the kingdom of God, but they don't just have to affect the church. They can affect government. Wouldn't it be great to have an apostle in office, yeah. in, the, in the governor's mansion, in the Senate, in the White House, to some, have an apostolic, truly commissioned, a five-fold minister in that kind of government seat? That would just be mind-blowingly awesome, right? Yeah. And it's entirely possible. We can have apostles in business and finance. All right. Apostles also can be a regional for a specific area like central Minnesota or something like that. They can also be national over an entire country. They can be international. Apostles can be over people groups like we talked about. They can be over industries or over geographical regions. I want to just expand your thinking as far as what their sphere of influence is. They can build in any of these things. And we see this again throughout the book of Acts that the, the apostles are forming groups. They're assigning leaders. They're answering questions. They're encouraging people. They're teaching. They're performing signs, wonders, and miracles. And yes, they're planting churches. 
Acts chapter 17 is a great example of this. Um, and this is the Apostle Paul, and I'm not, it's, it's really the entire chapter, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. We'll just read a little snippet, but I'm going to summarize it for you really quickly. So this is a great example of building, an apostolic building that is not church planting. All right, you with me? Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, Paul, Timothy, and Silas are in Thessalonica. This is the scripture that we have used here before that I actually said earlier that, uh, that Pastor Joshua, when he came here, preached on, is in his new book, Revolutionaries. And this is where we see the scripture, these are those who turn the world upside down. Paul's uh, reputation precedes him from, for, from Acts chapter 16. And he gets to Thessalonica and they're upset. Okay, you... you did, uh, created all this problem over there. Now you're over here. We don't want you here. They, they, they work up a mob because he's preaching in the synagogues. They work, so first and foremost, he's preaching to Jews here. Okay? He's preaching in the synagogues and he's preaching to Jews. They don't like it. He's preaching the resurrected Jesus and they got a problem with that. And so they work up a mob to go to try to find Paul. They pull Jason out, say, where is he? They're with the intent of beating him up and sending him off. Um, the brethren, the believers, hide him, and eventually they, they say, okay, we're going to sneak you off in the middle of the night so you don't get beat up. So, so they get sent off, all right? Then in Acts 17, verses 10 to 15, they go to, I think it's pronounced Ber- Beretha. Uh, uh, or no, not, uh, Ber- Beria, Beria. So in another place where they're preaching to the Jews. This time it goes a little better. All right, things are, you know, okay. No one's trying, threatening to kill them until the, the mob of Thessalonica learn that they're there and they actually send the mob there. Paul must have really made these guys angry, all right? <laughs> because they, they, it's not enough that he chased them out of their city. They got to follow him to the next city to get rid of him. So he, they get the mob worked up there as well. And now again, the brethren come and say, okay, we got to get you out of here. So we're going to send you to Athens. Athens is the Gentiles. It's not the Jews. You, you have a way of, of making the Jews angry, so we're going to send you to the Gentiles. In Athens, they're free thinkers. They, they're just open to any thoughts or ideas. You can preach to your heart's content, and they won't care. That's basically the idea. They think Paul will be safe there. They let things boil down a little bit. So Paul goes to Athens. Uh, Timothy and Silas wait behind. He gets to Athens, and, and uh, then Paul sends for them to come. So now he's in Athens and waiting for Timothy and Silas. And this is Acts 17, verses 16 to 32. Now, the first thing that we see in, the, in Athens is that it's, the Bible says that the spirit is provoked within him. This is that apostolic strategy coming to life. This is suddenly, you know, the, the, he's been sent there, even if it wasn't of his own will uh, or, or, you know, somewhat of his own will. But he's sent, sent to Athens, and now the spirit's provoked within him. There's, some, there's a stirring in him. There's something that's not right here. This is the beginning of an apostolic strategy. And the reason it's stirred within him is that he sees idols all over the place. All over the place. There are idols, there are gods all over the place. He, he talks about this all the time. And in fact, um, I, I might be getting my mythologies mixed up, but if you know the Greek or Roman mythologies, you know, Zeus and Poseidon, you've got the god of air, the god of water, the god of, of love, the god of war. They have gods for all these different things. This is what Paul is seeing, okay? And so... What does, uh, what does a good apostle do when he's waiting for uh, his, his uh, um, friends to get in, get in town and join him? He goes out and he preaches. He goes to the synagogues and he goes to the marketplace and reasons with them daily. So daily he is going to the marketplace. Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Let me tell you about Jesus. Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Let me tell you. He is just going talking to anybody who will listen in the marketplace about Jesus, about the resurrected Jesus, until... It gets the attention of the leaders of Athens, and he gets called to what's called the Areopagus, which is both an outdoor meeting place and a council. Okay, so it's a picture an outdoor sort of mini coliseum. The the Athens leaders are there, the city leaders are there. Paul's called before them, and they basically say, "Hey, we want to hear what you've been talking about." All right, not not in a threatening sort of way. So Paul now begins to do his building. He begins to implement his apostolic strategy that God has given him. Now remember, he's been preaching to the, to the Jews, and the cross has been, made them really mad. Now he's been preaching to the, the Gentiles, to the Greeks, and they're just like, you know, it's just another God. It doesn't make any sense. Why would your God die and then be raised again? What, what's the point of that? Okay? Paul even looks at, he starts from a place where, where they specifically say that they have an idol to an unknown God. And Paul says, I see here that you have an idol to this unknown God. Let me tell you 
about a God who is known. See, you have all these gods for all of these things. But let me tell you about my God. My God is the one that created all of those things. He goes back to the beginning, to creation, and says, says this God created everything, the heavens and the earth and the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals and plants, everything. He created it all, and he created humanity, and he created humanity for relationship. This was a foreign idea to them. And then he begins to establish the idea of sin because they had no frame of reference for sin. See, the Jews knew creation. The Jews knew sin. That wasn't the issue for them. They understand that fully. Their God created the universe. They understand fully the need for repentance, the need um, for sanctification. Okay, What they couldn't get was the cross. Now for the Jews, or for the Greeks, sorry, um, they're like, what's the point of your God? And he has to go back to the beginning and say, listen, our God created everything, and it was good, and, and then sin came in, and sin is this, this, and this, and, and now uh, he wants to have a relationship with you. He died so that you could be set free from those things, okay? He's going through all this. He's, he's going back to the beginning and, and laying the groundwork, okay? And then he, he finishes by saying, your time of ignorance is over. Before now, you have been ignorant, and God's been patient with you. You've been worshiping these idols. You didn't know any better, but I'm here, and I'm here to tell you your time of ignorance is over. It is time to repent. It's time to accept God. It is time to throw away these idols. And then in Acts chapter 17, verses 32 and 34, finishes up, and it says this, when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from them. However, some men joined him and believed. Now, this wasn't a huge day of Pentecost sort of thing where 3,000 souls were saved. Some people did, some mocked, and interest was piqued in people, right? See, what Paul did here is he identified the problem and identified a strategy for, for overcoming that problem, and then he laid the groundwork for transformation. It didn't happen overnight, but it did happen. Transformation did happen, but he had to start from the beginning and lay the groundwork. Now, I want to go back to 1 Corinthians for a minute, but remember that 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians was written during the book of Acts. So what we're reading here in Acts 17 was written probably 21, 22 years into the, uh, the, the birth of the church, and 1 Corinthians is written 25 years into the birth of the church. So, so 1 Corinthians, what we're about to read here is written three, four years after Paul's experience here in Acts chapter 17. So 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 24, Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Paul is specifically, I'm convinced, talking about his experience in Acts chapter 17. He's saying, listen, uh, I'm, I'm not just, this isn't theory. I've tried this. I've lived this. I've experienced this. The Jews, you have to handle this way. The, 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 the cross is a stumbling block. It'll make them mad. I know. Trust me. I've been there. All right? But for the, for the Gentiles, you got you to gotta go back to the beginning. You have to have a whole different strategy to reach these people than you have to use for these people. That's an apostolic mindset. God learned some, or Paul learned something from that experience, and he is now... Um, giving his wisdom to the Corinthian church. Amen? Amen? All right, so that is the building anointing. Now, I'll say one more thing about the building anointing as well uh, and the office of the apostle. Uh, the office of the apostle is unique in one way. Remember how we compared um, the ministries to construction workers. If the apostle was a construction worker, then he would be the general contractor. And the general contractor's job is a little bit different. I know, it's, it's crazy, Mark, right? <laughs> That's, that was our general co- contractor. Um, but uh, uh, the general contractor's job is different than anybody else. He's the overseer of everything. Um, the general contractor needs to know and understand the job of all the other people. The time it's going to take, the skill it's going to take, um, the order things need to be done in. All of that, the apostle is like this overseer. So, you know, you don't bring in the sheet rocker before the framing is done or the electrical or plumbing for that matter, right? You need to know the proper order. You need to schedule everything, plan everything. That's the strategy, right? Um, So if the apostle is the general contractor, then he needs to have a knowing and understanding of all the other four uh, fivefold ministry offices. And so because of that, to a degree, an apostle can flow in the other four more readily than, than other people can. He knows and recognizes 
and, and, and anointing that maybe there's something lacking uh, in, in his church, in this ministry, whatever, and, and there's not somebody pastoring right now, so I can step into that role and I can care for people and pastor people until somebody comes along that I can train to do it or something like that. So an apostle has the ability to, to switch hats to a degree because he knows and understands that. He's never going to flow as... Uh, as easily in those things as somebody who is, is called in directly into that office, but he will be able to do that job and do it quite well. That makes sense? Yes. All right. So the final anointing that we're going to talk about here is the fathering anointing. And again, um, when I say fathering anointing, or I'm talking about he is the apostle, uh, we believe that women can serve in fivefold ministry completely. So it's also a mothering anointing. It's just well, terminology for for sake of speaking here, we'll say fathering, but we believe in women in ministry. We believe in women. There, there's a, a New Testament example of a woman apostle as well. So we believe in all of those things, and I'm not so just know that and understand that. Now, the fathering anointing is uh, oftentimes primarily for other fivefold ministers, okay? Um, that uh, an apostle will be an overseer for other fivefold ministers, but is not limited to that. In the Bible, Paul calls Timothy, uh, Osimus, and Titus all his sons, and none of them were his natural sons. In fact, as far as we know, he, he's, he was never married. Okay, So he doesn't have natural sons, but he calls all of them his sons. So he's talking about them as spiritual sons. In 1 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17, he says this, I urge you, and he's speaking to the Corinthian church, I urge you to uh, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in the church. Now, we mentioned this before. Uh, Paul meets Timothy in Acts chapter 16. Timothy is a teenager. Uh, Corinthians is written about, about um, five years later than that. So, he is sending to the Corinthian church a kid who is, we don't know his exact age, but is either a teenager or in his early 20s. And Paul is saying of Timothy to the Corinthian church and this entire church, he's sending them a kid and saying, I want you to imitate me. I want you to do what I would do. I can't be there in person, so the next best thing is sending Timothy. So I want you to, to just do whatever this kid does. I want you to do whatever this kid says. I want you to follow his example, because by following his example, he, you are following my example. That's a lot of responsibility that Paul is putting on Timothy. He must have had a lot of trust in this kid. And in the reason he had a lot of trust in this kid is that, that starting with Acts chapter 16, up until this point, Timothy followed him everywhere. Yeah. He did everything with him. And, and Paul was pouring his life. He was pouring into him. He's pouring into him. He's pouring into him. He's pouring into him. He, he's, he's talking like Paul. He's walking like Paul. He's ministering like Paul. He's getting it. And now, just like the, Jesus poured into the disciples, he poured into them in the beginning of his ministry, and he taught them, and he taught them, and he corrected them, and, and he showed them different things until the point where they got full enough and that he felt like enough had been imparted into them that he could send them out now two by two. Now you've seen me do it. You've heard me. I have enough trust in you. Now you can go out and step out on your own and begin to find yourself. That's what a fathering anointing is. When we raise our kids, we raise our kids, you know, to the way that we want to see them raised. We, we have them follow our example, hopefully. We're being good examples, right? And that sort of thing. But the idea is to train them up in the way they should go teach them everything they need to, to know to be productive members of society, they're going to look like us. They're going to sound like us. They're going to have our quirks and, and, and you know, represent our personalities and our way of doing things. They're going to pray like us, right? But you send them out now when they reach a certain age and they begin to find themselves. They'll always look like you. They'll always sound like you, but now they'll, they'll begin to find their own identity, Okay? That's a fathering anointing, that you raise them up to a place where they are self-sufficient enough that you can feel confident in sending them out, confident enough that you can send a 20-year-old kid to a church that is in the midst of all kinds of crazy sin and, and is a very immature church and say to that church, imitate him. He's got it figured out. All right? That's a fathering anointing. It's a reproducing anointing. Basically, what Paul is doing here is he's saying, I have put enough of myself into Timothy, that you can, you can imitate Timothy and you will be imitating me, right? That, 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 and that's what reproducing is, that we make little copies of ourselves, right? That, that are different yet hold our DNA. Yeah. 
And the thing about a fathering anointing, it's not a controlling anointing, all right? The true father doesn't desire to keep his, his kids under his thumb, to keep them down. Doesn't, is, isn't resentful of his kids' gifts and talents. Yeah. Doesn't want them to rise up. So I've got to keep you here because I don't want you to rise up to the same level as me. That's not a, a, what a, a good father does. A good father desires to see his kids surpass him in every single way. A good father says, you can do it. You can do it. I stand on my shoulders. My, my ceiling should be your floor. I don't want you to have to plow the ground that I plowed. Yeah. I, w- I don't want you to have to have the struggles I had. I want you to have every, every um, benefit, every, every bit of favor that I have ever earned. I want you to just have this so you can take it and run with it. Amen. That's what a fathering anointing looks like. That's an apostolic anointing. It desires to see itself reproduced and far exceeded. Okay. Now, and we've got a little bit of time. Um, real quickly, I, I just want to get into just a, a quick pitfall. Every single one of the fivefold ministries has potential pitfalls to it. Um, if you're wired a certain way, then there's potential um, for abuses or pitfalls in, in a certain direction. In the office of apostle, um, that is micromanaging. See, if the apostle's the one that has the strategy and they can see the big picture and they, and they, they want to see God's plan Im- implemented on earth, the apostle can get impatient and can be, can be like, no, 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 I'll just do it. No, you're not doing it right. I'll do it, you know, and get into this micromanagement sort of thing. And it can sometimes come off as control when it's really not the intent. It, it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that uh, you just have to step back and realize and let people make their own mistakes sometimes and, and find themselves and that sort of thing. But that's one potential uh, downfall of the off or oversight, I guess you could say, of the office of apostles that you can, if you're not careful, you can get into micromanagement. It's just kind of a natural progression of how you're wired. So I, I say that so that if you, you know, if you find yourself talking to people or in those situations that you know that this is, is, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, doesn't mean that they're false or immature. It just, you know, it's, it's something that, that people in that office or people that flow in that anointing, okay, not just in that office, but people that flow in that anointing need to be aware of, right? So close out, um, what does this mean for you? Right, we've been taught. This makes sense. You grabbed hold of, of of what this is, right? So, what does this mean for you? Again, remember that all of these anointings are not just for the office. That there's something that we should we should flow in as believers. We are an apostolic church, and therefore we should be a church that uh, is sending, that is building, and is fathering people. Amen. And wherever you are at. You can, you can flow in these anointings. In fact, you know the natural evolution of discipleship? You know how many know and understand that Jesus, his, his final command that he gave us, the Great Commission, said go all, into all the world and make what? Disciples, right? To go into all the world and make disciples. That's what Jesus told us to do. Signs and wonders and miracles will follow that. But what is the natural evolution of discipleship? Jesus had 12 disciples that he called, that followed him, that he poured his life into, that he trained. And then ultimately, as he sent them out, he then, and they came back, he commissioned them as apostles. Does that mean that they ceased being disciples at that moment? No. He, it was in recognition that you're ready for the next step. See, being apostolic is the natural evolution of discipleship. We don't just disciple people to make them feel good. We don't disciple people just to get them in church and have them sit there and not do anything. We disciple people to the point where they can now become productive members of the body of Christ, where they can stand up and begin to go. It's the fathering anointing, right? To stand up and begin to find their gifts, their callings, and begin to operate in those things on their own. That's what the ultimate goal of discipleship is. And then eventually they get to the place where they're discipling people that become apostolic themselves. That's how the kingdom of God is established and spread. Every single one of us should be flowing these anointings. Every single one of us has a place that we're sent to be, whether that be in the family, whether that be in the marketplace, whether that be in the workplace. You know, one of the greatest apostolic sendings that you can have is in your family. We need more apostolic families, people that understand that my family is a ministry place and I am sent to that place that I need to build. I need an apostolic strategy 
my kids are all different. My kids are, are, are my kids, and I love them all, but they are very, very different. And I need a different strategy for each kid, and I need an overall strategy for how to keep my wife sane in the household, <laughs> right? And, and I, that's an, that can be an apostolic thing. If we're seeking God for a godly strategy in our family so that I can raise up my kids in the way they should go, then we are raising up a generation that, that is going to be so far ahead and, and is going to see things that we couldn't even possibly imagine here and now. I want to raise up kids that, that, where the supernatural is every day to them, where mind-blowing miracles are, are common and not the exception, amen? That, that one of the greatest places you can be sent is in the family. We need to know that. We need to understand that that we can go out into our workplace and, and we are sent to that place. That is our ministry place and that we can have an apostolic strategy how to read. You see, just like, just like Paul had a strategy different for the Greeks than he did for the Gentiles, you know your workplace environment. You know your school environment, right? You know that thing. You know the culture of that. Therefore, you know the best way to reach those people. The best way to reach people at a construction site is not going to be the same way to reach people in an office, right? And you know the culture. You know, you know if, it's, if it's filthy in language and things like that, you're going to have a strategy than if it's filled with, with, um, with believers and you just got like the one, the one person that's not saved and everybody's going to pounce on them. You know, it's a totally different strategy, right? You are put in a place where you have this unique, you're in this unique position where you can get an apostolic strategy and you can then take those people. Not everybody's going to receive. Not everybody received. Some people thought Paul was a fool. Some people thought, some people laughed at him. The day of Pentecost, people thought they were drunk. It said that, uh, that those who were glad, who gladly received were saved, but it didn't say how many didn't receive. Who cares how many didn't receive? But you know what? You focus on the ones that do receive, and then you father them. You mother them. You disciple them. You raise them up. You, you, you train them with the idea in mind, okay, that I see something in you. I see something in you that you don't see. I see something godly in you. you. I see a power in you. I see anointing in you. I see a grace in you. And I'm going to help you discover that. I'm going to help you walk in that. I'm going to help you flow in that. Follow me as I follow God. And when you get to the right point, I'm going to encourage you to go out. I'm going to push you out. I'm going to say, go out two by two. And and you, you now, you can do it. You have everything that you need, right? That's being apostolic. That's what we are called to be. Amen? You guys stand to your feet. Father God, I just thank you for each and every one that is gathered here this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word does not return void. I thank you that this house is an apostolic house. I thank you that this church is an apostolic church, that we are people that don't just sit idly by, that don't just warm seats, that we are alive and active in the body of Christ. I just pray, Lord, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, that you give the people that are gathered here and the people that are watching online apostolic strategies, strategies how to reach people wherever you have sent them. Wherever they are at, you have sent them, Lord. And I just pray that you give them strategies, that you begin to illuminate to them how they can reach the lost people, the hurting people, even even believers that, that are backslidden and, and hurting and, and not, not living their lives for the Lord, that you're going to give them a strategy wherever their sphere of influence is so that you can, they can reach that, that area where they have power, where they have authority. I pray, Father God, that your anointing rests heavily on them, that signs, wonders, and miracles will follow, that they will have boldness to speak up, to say what you have, have told them to say. They will have boldness to lay hands on the sick, that they will recover. I thank you, Father God, that you will bring them people that that receive the word gladly, and you will bring them people that they can mentor, that they can disciple, that they can father, that they can grow into the fullness of what you have called them to be. I thank you, Father God, that for the apostolic anointing that rests on this house and on this people, in Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. You guys are released. I just pray that, uh, you, Lord, give them traveling mercies as they go today. Declare in the name of Jesus, they are the head, not the tail, above and not beneath, uh, that uh, you send angels before and behind. Lord, ha- let us have a great and awesome week in Jesus' mighty name. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Next week, Office of Prophet.
We're so glad you're able to join us online today at High Praise Central Minnesota. If you happen to live in the Central Minnesota area, we would love to meet you in person. We have two Sunday services, our Sunday morning celebration service at 10 a.m. and our Sunday evening regional outpouring service at 6.30 p.m. We're located at 327 9th Avenue South, St. Cloud, right next to Lake George. We have online giving available at www.highpraisecentralmn.com. And don't forget to follow us and like us on Facebook. We hope to see you soon. God bless.